At first glance, the file structure used by Olama can be a bit overwhelming. It's pretty common for folks to want Olama to just use an unmodified model weights file without anything extra like so many other tools out there. But after you spend a little bit of time with it, you can't help but wonder why every tool doesn't do it in this much more elegant and obvious way. There are so many benefits to be had by this simple tweak, and I'll show you more in this episode of the Olama course. Welcome back to the Olama course. If this is actually your first introduction to the course, I'm going through all the aspects of using and working with Olama. Olama is the easiest way to work with AI models on whatever machine you use every day, uh, assuming it has a relatively recent and decent <laughs> GPU. You can get it up and running at olama.com. Click the big button in the middle of the page and you can get it going in just a few minutes. Then come back to the videos in this Olama course playlist to learn everything you need to know to start working with it. I'm Matt Williams and I was a founding member of the Olama team. I'm no longer working there and have decided to focus full time on my YouTube channel. So if you like content like this, be sure to like and subscribe to stay up to date on everything I put out. Okay, so let's dive into what is special about the file structure used by Olama. First, where are the files? Well, it depends on the OS and how you choose to run the service. The documentation for Olama can be found at this page. Docs update all the time, but as of the recording of this video, there is a FAQ or FAQ or frequently asked questions doc in that directory. Scroll down and you'll find a section that right now is titled, where are models stored? Ignore the models part for now. And you can see that on Mac OS, everything is under the dot Olama directory in your user directory. On Linux, assuming you installed with the official install script, it's at slash user slash share slash Olama slash dot Olama. And on Windows, it's just like the Mac dot Olama in your user directory. So from now on, I'll just refer to dot Olama and you can remember where that is for your OS. Okay, so in dot Olama, you'll find the history file, which shows all the questions you've asked and the private and public key used to pull and push models. These keys may look like SSH keys, but they're not. So don't use SSH keygen to replace them or you will run into issues. Then on Mac, there's a logs directory, which has logs for the service. Other platforms put them elsewhere, so you can find the details in the troubleshooting doc. Then there's a models directory. Now this is where all the files for the models live. So in that directory, there is a blobs folder and there's a manifest folder. If you look at blobs right now, you may be very confused. We'll come back to that, but never delete anything from this directory or you will break stuff. The manifest folder is the magic one. I'm going to, to assume that you have at least one model installed on your system. It's probably a Llama 3.1 or maybe 3.2. And it's probably the weights that are quantized to four bit. I talked a bit about quantization earlier in the course right here. You installed that model by running Olama pull Llama 3.2 for the 3.2 model. This model comes from the official library on olama.com. The actual location of that is registry.olama.ai. Olama.ai was the first domain we had before buying olama.com. And it's called registry because it's based on the registry for Docker. In fact, it was created by the same guy who I think created and definitely ran Docker Hub for a long time. In that directory, you'll find library. And in there, you'll find a folder for Llama 3.2 and every other model you've ever pulled from the library. Now, if you only pulled Llama 3.2 without specifying any tags, you'll have a file called latest in here. This is a terrible name because it has nothing to do with being the latest. It's just the word chosen for the default size. I've also pulled Llama 3.2 colon 1B and Llama 3.2 colon 3B. And so I have those files listed here. Now I'll list out the contents of latest using the cat command. 
This is a bit hard to read, so I'll pipe that to JQ, which is a way to pretty print JSON. Up at the top of this file is a block that describes the file. It's not all that important to understand, but no, this is not just Docker. The important stuff is in layers. For each layer, there's a media type, a digest, and a size. The media type is just a standard way to describe each layer. The first one says model, and this is the source GGUF file that is the model weights. Digest lists the SHA-256 hash of the file. SHA, S-H-A, stands for Secure Hash Algorithm. And that was designed by the US NSA to be a simple way to understand if a file has been modified in any way since the hash was generated. It's usually used with digital signatures and password hashing. But here it's used to help Olama see if the files it already has downloaded includes this file that needed for this model. If the file only went by its original file name, there wouldn't be an easy way to tell. This particular model has layers for the model weights, the template, two license files, and the parameters for the model. So let's consider the template. For this model, the template has this SHA-256 hash. Now, if we go back to .olama slash model slash blobs, we can find that exact file. I'll use cat on the file to show the contents and we see this. And that is the template for the model. We can confirm this by going to olama.com, finding the llama 3.2 model, and then click on template. And that looks like the same contents. Layers are a useful concept for models because in order to be of any use, the model weights needs to be combined with a template and in many cases, a system prompt to be useful. And most other tools guess what the prompt should be or, or require you to figure it out. Also to abide by the rules of the licenses many models use, the model should be distributed with the license. Many tools skip this part, potentially putting themselves into legal jeopardy. So let's say I create a new model file and set the model to use as a base to Llama 3.2. Then I'll set numctx to 10,000. There's no reason for that specific number, it's just a number that's easy to type. And then I'll create the model. My username on Olama is M. So I'll create M slash Llama 3.2 dash 10,000 and then push it up to Olama. If you want to see it, you can find it at this URL. But let's look at the manifest for that model and the manifest for the original Llama 3.2 model. See the SHA-256 for the model weights for both are the same. So if you already have the Llama 3.2 model and then you pull M slash Llama 3.2 dash 10,000, you'll be done in seconds because the model weights file doesn't have to be downloaded again you already have the file. Now, if I want to delete llama 3.2, then I need to run olama rm llama 3.2. But look at the blob files and we'll see that the weights for that model are still on my system because llama 3.2 dash 10,000 is using it. It's not until all models that use any blob are gone that that blob will finally get deleted. But if you had gone into the blobs directory and just willy nilly deleted that file, then you potentially mess up one, two, or maybe many other models that use the same weights file. The next time you restart Olama, all those orphan models will be cleaned up. But if you need to use any of them, you'll have to redownload the larger file again. Depending on your actions, you might get a cryptic error before that happens. Now, if you did want to use one of the model weights files in another tool, it's totally possible, but not really a use case Olama was designed for. You could figure out the blob file to use, then copy that file to a new directory, calling it whatever you want. It's still the same GGUF file format. There are a number of other tools out there that will do this for you. One of my favorites is called GoLama, and it's a simple CLI tool to sync models to any location you want with a friendlier name. I have a video about that tool that I made a few months back. Check it out to learn more, but I'm sure the author has added a bunch of new features since then. And that is pretty much everything you need to know 
about how the files are stored that Olama uses. As you can see, it's not all that hard to understand. And once you do, it becomes obvious why it's like that and how every other project just gets this wrong. It really is one of the key reasons Olama really is magical. I hope you found this episode of the Olama course interesting. And if you have any specific questions, feel free to leave a comment down below. I also have a newsletter that I send out every now and then. <laughs> you can sign up at technovangelist.com newsletter. Thanks so much for watching. Goodbye.